So what is the dollar end game? Everybody talks about the inevitable hyper Bitcoinization, but nobody actually discusses the steps along that path that we will inevitably have to cross. So today I got the author of a new book. Peruvian Bull is the name of the author of this phenomenal book. We talk about everything to do with CBDCs, the dollar end game, the BRICS de-dollarizing, and of course the steps that we believe we're going to be taking on the way to hyper Bitcoinization. Let's get straight into this chat with Peruvian. The ending of the dollar as the world reserve currency is like a nonlinear process and it will result in extreme inflation domestically and abroad as the entire system unwinds. It's kind of a doom and gloom book in some ways, but I also think that it's hopeful because I think that Bitcoin does serve as the solution to Triffa's dilemma and can fix this problem that has plagued global monetary systems for centuries. Today, I've sat down with a man who goes by the name of Peruvian Bull, and he is also the author of a book called The Dollar Endgame. Welcome to the podcast, Peruvian. Thank you for having me, Luke. I appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to talk. Yeah, me too. I uh, Your book is a very interesting one, and I think The Dollar Endgame is on everybody's minds right now. So let's maybe just give everybody a really high level synopsis um, of your book. Maybe we can give them the two or three minute TLDR version of what mm-hmm. is the dollar end game. Sure. So the book is my attempt to explain the problems with the US dollar being a reserve currency as it's currently structured. Um, back in the 1930s and 40s, uh, we were in a you know gold-based reserve system, and so gold was used as the settlement asset between countries. So if you know a country had a, a deficit or a surplus, they could send gold to each other to to balance it. Um, and the U.S. was the hegemon in this, like became the hegemon, especially after um, Bretton Woods in 1944, and was able to basically exert control over the entire global monetary system. However, the problem was is that with the U.S. dollar becoming the world reserve currency, it creates institutional demand globally for U.S. dollars. And so with only a limited amount of gold, the Fed was going to eventually run out of um, time and run out of gold uh, to back their dollars. And they're going to have to start devaluing right the dollar to have to create more and more dollars to send out to the global system um, to keep the global system running. And so th- this was uh, what is called Triffin's Dilemma. It was discussed by this economist Robert Triffin in 1960. And um, he eventually posited that there's no solution to this. We either print money and we create more dollars than gold reserve would than the gold reserve would normally back, or we let we don't print dollars and the entire system starts to run out of cash and run out, run out of liquidity and not be able to function because the U.S. dollar is the central underpinning for basically all global trade and and of course like the treasury market and and reserve balances at, at different central banks. So um, this. This problem has never really been solved. Every single reserve currency at, on a long enough time frame has collapsed because they run into this problem of having to export more and more of their own currency globally. Um, and the U.S. has been able to uphold this for so long because after 1971, we went back into a pure fiat standard, created petrodollars, the euro dollar market came into view, and we were able to satisfy demand without actually having to have gold or any real asset backing it. We could just print dollars. But this system never lasts forever, and now the new backing of the system is treasuries. And treasuries have been the risk-free asset. Rates have been falling for the last 40 years. Everything's been fine. But in the last two to three years, we've really started to see, see cracks open up in the system and uh, potential threats open up from, from other countries uh, for the structure of the, of the global reserve system. And what I've tried to lay out is that the ending of the dollar as the world reserve currency is like a nonlinear process, and it will result in extreme, I believe, extreme inflation domestically and abroad as the entire system unwinds. Um, and so I kind of, it's kind of a doom and gloom book in some ways, but I also think that, um, it's hopeful because I think that Bitcoin does serve as the solution to Triffa's dilemma and can, um, fix this problem that has plagued global monetary systems for centuries. Yeah. That's a really good breakdown of pretty much the past 80 years. Um, that's a really nice leading actually to something that's going on today. And that is we have these BRICS countries, so Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, China. Uh, who did I forget? China? No, I think that's all of them. So we, the BRICS countries just announced they've got a new global reserve currency, or they're going to try to create a new global reserve currency. And I think uh, we did a video on this earlier in the week. There's like another 15 countries who have also expressed interest in becoming a part of this BRICS coalition and seemingly abandoning the US dollar. So mm-hmm. what's your thoughts on this whole movement proving? 
so this is the this is the thing I've gotten into a lot of arguments uh, about on Twitter, and I've talked to a lot of people about. Um, Brent Johnson, Santiago Capital, makes some really good points here. I think the first thing to recognize is that no individual other country could really be a new world reserve currency. And the reason why is because if you look at countries like Russia or China, which are the purported to be the main antagonists to the U.S. and the supposedly the solutions to the new or the the um, yeah solutions for the new system, the problem is these are export-based economies. And to be a reserve currency, you need to be a net importer because you have to net export currency. If you think about it on, on a trade view, you have to net export currency everywhere. It means you have to be a net importer of goods. And neither of these countries are set up to be net importers of goods in the long term. And especially China has a closed capital account. So they don't really fully allow free flow of capital through their country, which you have to do as a world reserve currency. So individually, none of these I don't believe that any of these countries could, like the yuan or the ruble, could not be um, individually reserved currencies. Now, if they band together and create a decent, like, I guess, quote unquote, decentralized currency block and a floating currency unit, that could potentially be used, um, you know, regionally. But the the same, we run into a similar issue where, you know, a lot of people say, well, what backs, you know, the U.S. dollars, the U.S. Treasury market? Well, what would back this new currency? especially if it's you know bilaterally issued by multiple countries. And so if they're going to use commodities, if they're going to use oil, if they're going to try to use their own debt markets to collateralize or to underlie this currency, um, it's going to cause issues because the same with the, the system has trust issues in the in US treasuries, right? Like treasuries are not no longer risk-free. They will have the same issues with Chinese bonds or Russian bonds. Mm. So... Like the, I think it's possible that these countries can create regional trading blocks with each other, but for them to become a new global system, like a global reserve currency, would be extremely difficult. Um, just because there, there's just not enough institutional demand and institutional trust in them. And I mean, why would there be, right? Like Russia has defaulted on debt many times. I think the last time was 1998. Um, China has a closed capital account and extremely totalitarian economy, and you know a uh, command control type monetary system where the, they can just force um, reserve banks and and local banks not to allow you know capital flight. So it's extremely difficult for these countries in their current political and economic milieu to do this. Um, but they can. That said, they can steal away some market share from the dollar on the margins of the system by doing you know regional currency trading. Um, but I think the real threat here is from things like Bitcoin. Mm. That's yeah. really interesting. Uh, I definitely want to tease apart how Bitcoin fits into this geopolitical world a little bit later on into the pod. I want to quickly read a quote from your really good book. Uh, towards mm -hmm. the end, you uh, you say, there is no unipolar world in our future, only a multipolar one with various regional powers vying for control. In this sort of system, the new reserve currency would have to be a neutral one. Uh, would you... Give the listener a little bit more uh, surrounding that quote there, and then maybe we can talk about the uh, the solutions you propose that could be a neutral reserve currency. Sure. Yeah. So again, like the issue is, as a reserve currency, you have to have an you have to have a list of qualities that your nation uh, can fulfill. And like I said, one of them is you have to be a net importer of goods. So it means that if you if you're manufacturing like the U.S. was a manufacturing giant up until we started taking on the the burden of reserve currency. Um, and this is where the reserve currency becomes a double-edged sword because on one hand, we get this this massive amount of institutional demand, institutional demand for our currency. So our currency is artificially strong. We can print amounts of it, like huge amounts of it that don't cause inflation in the same ways that it does for other countries. Um, however, it causes us to have to export manufacturing globally. So we, we have to move our own manufacturing base out of our country because we have to be a net importer of goods. We can't be making the goods here. We have to buy them from abroad because we need to send the dollars abroad. Um, and so these countries, you know, they do fulfill some of these requirements. They are, you know, maybe large enough population wise. Maybe their their bond market is getting close to liquid enough. I mean, there's no bond market that compares to the treasury market. But, you know, the Russian Chinese bond markets do have some liquidity. They need to be a lot more robust to handle the level of volume. Um, but like fundamentally, none of these countries can fulfill the the role of you know global reserve currency because they don't 
they don't have these fundamental characteristics that I've talked about that allow them to constantly net export their own currency and to handle the amount of um, you know demand and 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 debt for their for their currency. Um, and so, yeah, these countries again may have regional control, may have regional power, but it's hard for me to see how Russia and China will basically rule the world and become the US 2.0 when they have so many weaknesses. I mean, also demographically, we talk about, you know, China had the one child policy for decades and it's just destroyed their um, long term viability. And same with Russia. Russia's Russia has a war, has a has a lower uh, average life expectancy rate than Syria and Syria is a war torn country. And so these countries are not they are definitely threats to the US in a lot of ways, but they're not these, um, you know, like they're they're not on the same levels like Germany and Germany was against you know the UK in the 1940s. That we aren't like equal, um, mm. and so um, this multipolar world makes a really interesting like you know environment geopolitically because without the U.S. as the as the primary enforcer of of global trade, it 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 begs the question of how is trade going to be settled, and mm. so this is where um, I've talked about the the potential solutions to um, you know, uh, what, how a multipolar world would handle uh, global trade and a global reserve currency. Yeah, let's get into that because in your book, you propose three solutions. So we've got an SDR, a gold back currency or mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Let's talk about those three solutions and the pros and the cons of each. Sure. So an SDR is what's called a special drawing right. It was created um, first in 1964, I believe, mm -hmm. um, by the IMF. And basically what it is, it's, it's, a single currency unit that's backed by a basket of other currencies. So you can think of, if you know about the Dixie, the US dollar index, it's the US dollar versus the basket of other currencies, mainly the Euro and the Yen, but also um, a lot of other currencies like the pound and the Yuan and the ruble. Um, and the SDR was basically supposed to be this neutral monetary unit that would be able to be transferred within the system so countries could settle trade with each other without having to incur these problems of trade imbalances, right? The issue with that is that the IMF is not really neutral, right? It claims neutrality, but it's really funded and run by the United States and by the UN. And so if – like, for example, Russia invading Ukraine, from our point of view, is an evil thing, and I think it genuinely is an evil thing. But maybe from Russia's view, at least from the from their government's view, this is necessary. And for them to be sanctioned for this is unacceptable, and the IMF – you know, we've seen this with with the uh, sanctions placed on Russia in, in February of 2022. You know, all these institutions like SWIFT network, for example, which is the global telecommunications network between banks, supposed to be neutral. And the U.S. was able to leverage it into freezing transactions to uh, Russian banks. And so all this is, is to say, like, the IMF is not really neutral and it doesn't really have the ability to, um, like – create a currency, I, a genuine currency, I believe, that could actually solve the problems of Triffin's Dilemma. Um, and also, we, we're still running into the same problem, like what backs the currency? Other fiats, and what backs that? Government debt. Well, government debt is all insolvent. It's, mm. it's it, you know, we're at 356% global debt to GDP. There's no way any of it has any value. And so I view that as just another, putting another house of cards on top of the current one to try to fix it. Mm, that's exactly how I see it. Uh, so your second solution, you talk about a gold-backed uh, currency. And this is interesting because it kind of ties into the geopolitical mm -hmm. uh, moves that are happening around the world today. So my base case today is I think that these BRICS countries, I think they might try to create a new reserve currency backed by gold. That's my base case. I have no strong opinion on it. And then I think countries are left with a choice. Okay, what do I trust more? a uh, paper-backed treasury uh, to save in or a gold-backed BRICS reserve currency. Uh, and then I think, I, I I don't know, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think the BRICS are more likely to go over gold-backed currency? Do you think the world will come together and create a gold-backed currency? Or how do you see all of that shaking out? Sure, I think that's much more likely. Um, I would highly recommend uh, anyone interested in this, read Luke Groman's two books on this, The Mr. X Interviews, Volume 1 and Volume 2, where he basically lays out um, a lot of the underlying desire for all these countries to move out of the dollar system, the euro dollar network. Um, and if you look at like, you know, central bank gold purchases, they were a record high in 2022 and they're still soaring in 2023. The Bank of Russia, 
um, you know, the Bank of China, the People's Bank of China are both buying gold in mass and both of them are, are offlaying all their treasuries. They're slowly divesting from treasuries. And so gold has been used as a, you know, reserve currency and, and as basically like a settlement asset within the monetary system for decades. It, you know, the, the last for centuries, really, the last few decades is only the only aberration where it hasn't been the case. Um, and so it's not impossible to imagine that a reset to a new monetary system would require, um, you know, at least transition period with gold being one of the reserve assets held by banks, by central banks. Um, but I, I think, again, it, this runs into a similar issue that we've already talked about um, with Triffin's dilemma, but just more broadly with fiat monetary systems based on gold or gold reserve systems is that – you know, we if we switch back to a gold reserve system and all these countries have to hoard gold and then like to settle trade imbalances, they ship physically ship gold to each other and they issue fiat notes off that gold. Who audits the vaults? Who's who, who's there to say that that we actually know how much gold is there? I mean, the Federal Reserve, um, you know, claims to have, you know, thousands of tons of gold. But if you actually look at the U.S. Treasury and the U.S. Federal Reserve, a lot of their assets are what are called gold certificates. So it's these are basically like, you know, like. I guess, financial or legal contracts that say this is a note that says that I own gold and I've, I've lent it out to mm -hmm. someone else and it's held by a custodian bank. But no one knows if the gold is actually there. And so I think that could that would be an issue that we'd run into um, and would cause in the long run, you know, this system to fail again, because we'd just be repeating the same issue uh, that we've already had. Yeah. And that gets into your third and final solution mm -hmm. in your book. And uh, that is Bitcoin. Uh, how do you think Bitcoin uh, is going to be adopted geopolitically and uh, used as a potential uh, a weapon geopolitically? Sure. Yeah. So actually, this is really interesting. I talked about this with uh, Daniel Prince on the Once Bitten podcast just last week. And this is where I think we have found, I and I truly believe it is a, a pure solution to Triffin's Dilemma. Right. The, the the main issue with Triffin's dilemma is that it's a centralized in entity that's issuing it. So it has to constantly issue more and more and more in order to satisfy the, uh, the demand for from the system. But with a decentralized entity issuing it, you don't have the centralized issue entity problem. And so the solution is solved. Mm -hmm. And all it takes, I believe, is for a few central banks to start to move towards Bitcoin um, storage and custody for the dominoes to start to fall and the snowball to start to roll really quickly and for things to start to change. And again, I, I know a lot of Bitcoiners and gold bugs, and I'm one of these people who I, I hate central banks. I don't want to think of them as buying any part of the network. But one way you can think about this is if the central banks all buy Bitcoin and all start adopting Bitcoin and global trade, they're, they're putting the nails in their own coffin, right? They're speeding up their own obsolescence. And so this will actually help us in the long run because it will allow us to move to a completely, you know, reserve Bitcoin based reserve system and the central banks will basically be wound down and dismantled and that those funds will be sent to the government probably as a trust fund or a you know you can think of like a safety deposit box for them to use in a military conflict or a national disaster um instead of you know just being used as in as they currently are instruments of inflation and so although it's you know a lot of people may not like this way of thinking about it i think it's a very useful way to say like this is how the whole entire global monetary system can change we just need enough of these especially smaller countries can start adopting bitcoin and only demanding to accept bitcoin as a reserve asset um and then it'll force other countries to get into this really interesting game theory where they say Hey, um, you know, five of my neighbor countries are all hoarding Bitcoin and they're mm. they're they're printing they're, they might even be printing their own money and actively stacking SAS with it. Like, what do I do? If I do nothing, then what happens is in 10 years when we're in a new Bitcoin reserve system, that as a country I'm broke, I have nothing. So all my wealth will be gone because the fee, you know, no one will want my currency because why would they want it when they can accept Bitcoin? And so I'll have to earn it by physically working. Um, you know, from basically from ground zero, like I'll have to, it's like resetting your entire country's wealth to zero. And so that, you know, that is pretty scary and people may bash politicians all they want, but the one thing people, politicians want is to stay in power. And the way they stay in power is by trying to keep at least some people somewhat happy, not enough to riot in the streets. And so if, if this is 
the game theory starts to play out, it, you start to see very quickly how the dominoes fall and how just a few countries adopting Bitcoin as a reserve currency starts to move into the entire system adopting it and eventually hopefully the Fed adopting it and then the Fed obsoleting the dollar forever and the Fed being obsolete forever. Yeah, I I see the dominoes falling pretty quickly as well. I see like, I think things are going to happen so much quicker than most people think. I think the legacy system is weaker than anybody thinks it is. And I think that's just all going to act as a catalyst for Bitcoin adoption. And then like I agree with you on the flip side, when that tipping point is reached, I think adoption can happen really, really quickly. Um, we probably saved that discussion for a whole nother podcast. I want to transition this one a little bit because in one of your really good uh, YouTube videos that you've put together, I recommend everybody mm -hmm. go and check out your channel. Actually, you're talking about uh, obviously a lot of the derivative space and you also mm -hmm. talk about uh, the globally systematically important banks and with everything happening with Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank, I would love your opinion on those two uh, globally system systematically important banks. Yeah, so I haven't I haven't dug through their financials recently. Specifically, I did dig through them like a while ago just to learn more about what they do. But the the problem with all these, especially the European banks, is a lot of them are still holding, you know, losses from their bond portfolio that they've incurred in the last few years because they were they were kind of all honey potted into buying bonds at zero percent rates, and then their central bank like the ECB just starts hiking and they start getting mass bigger and bigger losses. And if you actually look at Deutsche and Credit Suisse, their problems have gotten worse recently, but they didn't start recently. They, they started in the 2008 financial crisis. And if you look at their equities, both of them have been falling since about 2009, um, 2008, 2009. And they've never ever like recovered their all-time highs or anything close to it. And so these banks are, they're over leveraged um, like to such an extent that like bailing them out or trying to, um, you know, for investors to try to recapitalize them is 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 essentially impossible. They need a central bank to to really like help them. And that, this is what happened to Credit Suisse. Is um, I was watching their CDS. I was watching their um, you know, like their overall market condition, and they were being. I was reading articles. They were being pulled, like cash was being pulled out of Credit Suisse by the day. The uh, Saudis were consulted on rescuing them, and the Saudis went through their books, and after two days, said no. Um, several other large investors pulled out and basically, you know, they, the Swiss government forced UBS to do a, a, a you know, I guess a hostile takeover or a forced acquisition of, of Credit Suisse and the, and this, and the Swiss taxpayer is going to ultimately be on the hand on, you know, be on the, on the hook for the payments. Right. So, you know, I think it was a $14,000 per person, it's billions and billions yeah. of dollars, about 80, 82 billion, I think. And so these banks are weak and they've, been weak since 2008, but the problems are only getting worse with the recent bond uh, fiasco. Yeah, I think that point's one that we should definitely double click on. If you're living in Switzerland, every single one of you are paying 13 and a half or $14,000 for the bankruptcy of Credit Suisse. That, I read that and it shocked me. I was like, geez, that's, a, that's, a, that's like a bail-in. That's nearly as bad as mm -hmm. having your deposits bailed in. Exactly, uh, yeah. It was wild. Um, and it was nearly as wild as something else you talked about uh, in another one of your videos. And that was the crash of 1987. Most uh, mm -hmm. people would know that as Black Monday. Um, you you laid out some probabilities there of some, some of the economists were so very sure that we would never see a crash in the stock market. And for the listener and for the person on YouTube, I might put up a chart on screen that you actually have in your YouTube video. And it's a chart of the stock market going absolutely parabolic in the 1980s. And Economists were looking at that chart saying there's no chance we would see any sort of crash or anything happen to this stock market. Uh, so Peruvian, I'll hand the baton over to you and uh, let you kind of explain what happened in 1987. Sure. Yeah. So the problem that we ran into in the 80s was, for one, there was deregulation in the financial sector to a large extent. Um, corporate raiders came in and leveraged buyouts became a massively uh, common thing. And so all these banks and all these investment banks just started buying and um, you know leveraging themselves on on debt and equity instruments. Um, you know the Fed was tightening in the early '80s, but became much looser, especially towards the end of the '80s, which started to boost uh, equity markets, especially. Um, because we're beginning the stage of the 40-year bond market and equity market bull run. Um, and the bigger problem was in the 1980s, they created this these two um, 
these two inventors, uh, and, and both of them, I think one of them had won the Nobel Prize for uh, macroeconomics, Mark Rubenstein. Mm -hmm. um, he created, uh, along with a Hank, I think it's Hank Leland, Leland O'Brien Rubenstein Associates, and they created this program called Lore. And Lore was a dynamic hedging program that could basically watch the market and it would short sell S&P 500 futures if the market started to fall. So that way, your portfolio would gain money as the market falls because you're shorting the futures at the same time the market is going down. So theoretically, it was risk-free insurance and it was termed portfolio insurance. And this insurance became to be used widespread throughout the system. And the problem is, and this is the same problem that I would say is analogous to our current system, is nothing is insurance if it's one based on the on the fragile or the you know stability of its own financial system, and two if everybody's using it, mm -hmm. right? If everybody's insured by the exact same insurance, then it's not really insurance because this is the same thing that played out in two thousand eight. Like AIG insured all these mortgages, insured all these CDOs, and then all the CDOs start falling, and now everyone is coming to AIG for um, for their money and the AIG doesn't have it. And so during 1987, the stock market was ripping upwards and then we started to hit some periods of massive volatility. And all these people were using these, um, I would call them, they're, they're, var, they're called VAR models, but they're just essentially probability models that would say like the risk of an extreme, like a one day drop in uh, the markets is no more, like it can't drop more than 5% or can't drop more than 4%. And so their models told them it was, any extreme losses were impossible, so it's okay to keep leveraging and leveraging up. And so in 1987, on Black Monday, um, October 19th, the market started falling, and it was it, it, it's just a confluence of you know the perfect storm, the confluence of factors started ripping the market uh, down. And then all these you know portfolio insurance algorithms started force selling S and P 500 futures, which drives the futures market down. And then people see the futures market falling, and there's these arbitragers who they'll buy the the futures that are falling and they'll they'll you know maybe they'll transfer them into the individual stocks and they'll sell the individual stocks and so now this feedback loops these hidden feedback loops that lurk under the surface of the market start emerging where these arbitragers are buying the futures that are falling and then they're selling the underlying index they're shorting the underlying index which causes the index to fall which causes the futures to fall which just it's just a it's like a ever repeating feedback loop and the market ended up falling 22%, which they later calculated was the probability was one in 10 to the one sixtieth, which is, uh, to, for reference, there's one in there's about 10 to the uh, 78 atoms in the universe. So we're talking what 80 orders of magnitude more atoms than there are in the universe. So this just shows you how ridiculously stupid these models are. Like. At that point, these models should have been thrown out of the door and those guys should have been, you know, their names should have been thrown on, like buried under the prison. Like just call them idiots and they don't know what they're talking about. But this stuff is still taught in modern finance classes today. And it's very reminiscent of the Keynesian economics we have at universities. Yeah, I'd say that, you, that uh, little walk back in memory lane of 1987 that you did on the YouTube channel is very interesting. Uh, I would encourage people to definitely check it out. And uh, we've only got a few minutes left here. So I would also love for you to let the listeners know a little bit more about your book and where they can find you online. Sure. Yeah. So I published a book called The Dollar Endgame. Uh, hyperinflation is coming. And it's a very, again, it can be a very scary title, but I think it's genuinely true. Um, you know, and and the thesis of the book is not only this problem with reserve currencies, it's further that the treasury itself is trapped in a black hole of the Fed's design. The Fed has created so, so much debt and so much leverage in the system, and especially a lot of this leverage is in the treasury where they have $31 trillion of debt and $182 trillion of unfunded liabilities. They'll have to print forever just to pay everything because we're past the event horizon. Um, Luke Grohman pointed out, and this was a great chart, where um, 111% um, of tax receipts are now going to pay what's called the true interest on the debt. So that's interest expense plus entitlements. And so the Treasury is already beyond the event horizon, and there's no rescue in it. And the only way the Fed can try to keep it above water is by printing forever. And so the, the book is... Again, it's it's. I think it's concerning, but I think it it needs to be said. These things need to go out there because this is what I truly believe is happening, and we're in the early stages of seeing it. Um, but the book is live right now on Amazon. You can pick it up in paperback or Kindle. I also have a YouTube channel, like you've said, just Peruvian Bull. Um, I I'm on Twitter and Reddit at Peruvian underscore Bull. 
And I also have a website called thedollarendgame.com. And you can go there and, and read uh, basically everything I have for free. And I'm also working on some other cool side projects. I'm building some dashboards to track global liquidity and to more like to visualize the uh, repo and reverse repo markets and the money markets uh, internationally. But um, that's what I'm working on for now. And I hope to make this full time eventually. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So I've once again had a couple of technical difficulties. So I'm going to have to finish this interview off with Peruvian myself. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. But if we do transition to a Bitcoin standard and the dollar does have an end game, how much purchasing power is one Bitcoin going to have? Well, that's something I explored when we tore apart BlackRock's 2022 paper where they said the optimal allocation to Bitcoin is 85%. So if you want to learn a little bit more about what the price of Bitcoin will be after the dollar end game, I definitely recommend you check out the recent video we recorded on that topic right there. And with all that said, you can find all of the links to Peruvian's amazing work down below. And I really hope you enjoyed this one. See you in the next one.